good morning, good morning, and thank you for joining me on another episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. I have a full house for you today. All five guests showed up, and so that tells me today's show is going to be even more entertaining, interesting, and educational than usual. So I'm going to ask you to do what I always ask you to do. That's right. I want you to wake your friends up. If you're on the West Coast, wake them up, get them up out of the bed. I want you to tweet them, text them, call them whatever it takes, but friends don't let friends miss out on the round table talk show. So that's right. Go ahead and hit that share button because they do not want to miss today's show. I can already tell from the energy backstage that today is going to be interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to our first guest, Andrea Hubert, and she is the co-founder of Solopreneur Society. Good morning, Andrea. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Of course. I'm excited to, to speak to you because your organization, your company is Solopreneur Society. And one of the things that I often talk about is when I started this entrepreneur journey, I missed all my coworkers. I'm like, everything else is great, but it's like, okay, I'm over here alone, trying to figure it out by myself. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, Andrea. I think it's so funny that you said that because that's one of the things that we say is that we are colleagues without cubicles. Yes. Um, <laughs> so the Solopreneur Society, you know, as solopreneurs, we're a different breed, right? But we know one thing to be true, and that is if we fully lean into our personality, our brand archetype, and we back that up with psychology-based methods, then we can win. You know, it doesn't matter the size of our business at that point, because what really matters is, is how are we tapping into the psyche of our audience? So that's what we do with at the Solopreneur Society. We help our clients and students focus on brand development, storytelling, and customer experiences. How did you come up with the idea though? of the Solopreneur Society? Yes. So I have a co-founder, her name ironically is also Andrea. <laughs> and uh, she is a brand um, and design expert. I have the sales and marketing and we have been, I don't like to use this term, but fangirling each other for many, many years because she helped me with the branding of my first company. And mm -hmm. so we decided that, you know, there's no reason that we shouldn't partner up. Um, and so we did, and we're out to disrupt the market. That's who we are. <laughs> well, I love disruptors. Those are my fav favorite. <laughs> Those are the ones that I like to sit down with and have chats with. So when one, I know you mentioned a lot of different areas and avenues of your organization. Specifically, at what stage are you looking for people to work with? Are you looking for the entrepreneur who has just started out? Maybe the entrepreneur who's floundering and hasn't, you're like, okay, I need help. What is your ideal goal? So we... Um, we love working with everybody and we have different ways of doing that, whether it be through our, you know, courses and free um, trainings and educational materials or through our paid engagements as clients. But um, primarily we focus on solopreneurs who have some experience with their business and they're looking either to rebrand um, and really tap into who they are or they're looking to scale and grow. Mm, okay, I just wanted to know where I was on the list because I'm looking to scale and grow. I have to take Ash Sharifa to the next level so I can get all of you out in front of the world. So I have more questions for you, Andrea, but I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest. So that way we can start the conversation, get this going, get this engagement going and start the learning. Our next guest is Melissa Karakchek. She is an author of 10 books and she focuses on social entrepreneurism, philanthropy, and she's also a consultant. Good morning, Melissa. How are you? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm excited to have you here. The whole theme today seems to be entrepreneurs, 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 and I love it. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Melissa, and what you do. Um, so I typically work with the 1%, the ultra wealthy. Um, I've owned a consulting firm for 13 years and have built, I don't know how many businesses, thousands of businesses over the last 13 years and have helped so many people. But at the end of the day, 
Um, I came from nowhere and nothing. So uh, my little town had 277 people. And my dad specifically said, like, you're not going to make it because his dad didn't make it and his dad didn't make it. And I said, well, that's not going to happen. I'm going to make it. Um, and so I was the first in my family. And I think that's the biggest accomplishment for me is just to be able to have that ultimate freedom and be able to travel wherever and help people along the way. And so it's not where you came from or what you had or didn't have. It's what your mindset says you can achieve and then what you ultimately do on a daily basis to achieve those things. Now, I usually don't pry into people's business. Actually, that's <laughs> not true. I pry into people's businesses every morning at eight o'clock. But I usually don't pry too much into their personal financial business. But I'm just curious because you said I was the first to make it. And usually when somebody says that, there's it's followed by, you know, first to make it to college, first to do this, first to do that. So specifically in your family, are you the first person to make it out of this town? I mean, uh, yeah, so that's a, a first person to make it out of the town, the first person to move into a mansion, the first person to sell their company for eight figures or even make seven figures of that, probably even six figures. <laughs> um, the first to do a lot of the things that embody. Now, what's awesome actually about this is my dad and my father have now um, become successful entrepreneurs and two of my uncles and now my cousin. So as of last year, there were six of us, but it took a long freaking time, uh, 200 years, six generations, and one person to say like, dude, I'm not doing this. <laughs> no, I, I love it. That's wonderful. So Melissa, where are you located? Oh, I'm in the heart of Minneapolis. <laughs> okay. Well, one way or another, I think I'm going to head to Minneapolis, <laughs> sit down there and talk to you because I want to be the first of the eight figures as well. So I need to rub elbows a little bit with you, Melissa. Awesome. Well, we can do that. I think most of our audience wants to learn how to be the first. So what are some of the strategies that you offer to people who are like, you know what, I have to break this generational curse? Honestly, I work on checklists. And so this is the easiest thing for anybody on any season of their life. So take a checklist and start working with it. Pilots um, never leave the ground without their co-pilots or their stewardess running through a checklist. Your race car drivers never run their cars without their guys running through a checklist. Doctors do not do surgery without running through a checklist. So checklists are absolutely pivotal to success, whether it's, and honestly, I have this on my refrigerator, like I got a haircut or I maintained my car or I mowed my lawn or any of those things. But in business, it's like, Hey, who was the last person you reached out to? Why did you reach out to them? Why do you think they were significant to your business? How often are you going to touch base with them? Can you send them a thank you card? Like all of those little touch points are absolutely critical to your success. So a checklist is the first and the last place I would go to be successful in whatever area you choose, be it fitness or money or um, even just investing in relationships. Hmm. I'm curious. As, I love that, you know, because I'm thinking before the show, I have a checklist, my little checklist of things I say to the guests before coming on on the show. But yeah. what is, is the psychology, at least in your belief system behind success and the checklist? I'll give um, you it's not so much psychology. It's literally that you are crystal clear on what you're trying to achieve. You are cannot get distracted by your dogs or your kids or really anything else because you know that this is what you're working towards. Mm -hmm. And then because it's written out, you don't really have that opportunity to say like, well, I forgot because mm -hmm. you didn't forget. And it was so important that you wrote it down. So energetically, you're like, I'm going to achieve this. Um, and it's been proven statistically that if you write something down, you're 93% more likely to achieve that thing. So, I mean, whatever's a priority to you, you're you're gonna write down and you're gonna make happen. So I, I love the checklist idea just because I know that it works over and over and over. Mm, that's wonderful. Andrea, you have checklists? I do. I, I totally believe the same thing that once you write it down in a checklist, you're much more committed to accomplishing it. Mm, that's wonderful. I wanna introduce our next guest. 
and I'm gonna see if he has some checklists. I don't know, but he is an award-winning commercial photographer and film director, Mr. Michael Greco. Good morning, Michael. How are you? Thank you. I want to thank you for having me and our audience for watching today. You are welcome. Thank you for joining us. Do you have checklists, Michael? Um, I have more lists and more software and more organization than you can imagine. So, um, I, you know, I think that organizing your business in general is very, very important. So I'm constantly, you know, sometimes I'll use my email as my checklist and I'll use a list. I'll use my calendar. If someone doesn't pick up the phone who was supposed to you know, I wanted to get a hold of, I'll put a calendar event for a couple of days later. Like I have many strategies on how to accomplish what I need. And, and most of it for me is working out of my email box. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'll BCC myself on emails that are important that I need to follow up with. Mm -hmm. And every couple of weeks, I'll go through 600 emails in my email box to make sure to get them down to about 250 or 300 and make sure I've replied again or reached out again or um, made sure that something's happened. So it's organization is very important. You can't run a business without it. That is definitely key. I, I'm always interested when people talk, discuss emails and inboxes because my inbox is always empty. Like it's it never empty. It has it never has emails and people always say how do you do that like my friends like i have twenty three thousand emails in my inbox i'm like no no mine has right now probably three and those are pending and then once i've finished it it's out of the inbox so that's just me yeah i mean i i, I mean i've got an email system so my you know i it's I've got rules in my email that filter emails to their appropriate boxes, Amazon and newsletters and stuff like that. But I work out of my email box. I mean, that's mm -hmm. my, that's my list. Mm -hmm. So I, not everyone answers you. I, you, I wish the world worked as quickly as I do mm -hmm. and answered in, in at the speed that I do, but mm -hmm. I can send an email to, you know, I've got a new book coming out in uh, November. I'm, trying to put together gallery shows, I can email a gallery and never hear from them. So mm -hmm. in two weeks, I need to go through my emails again and remember to e reach out to that gallery to either call or email again. And I just work out of my email box. I, I heard Steve Jobs did that. So I figured if it was good enough for Steve Jobs, it's good enough for me. Hey, I, I don't know, but I might have to look into it. If that's what Steve Jobs does, I, I might have to consider it. I work out of mine too. That's why I get rid of everything. It's like done, <laughs> done, complete, finished, answered, responded. You know, and everybody's always like, wow, you get back to us so fast. I'm like, because I got to handle it and get it done. But I digress a little bit. We talked about emails and lists and organization. I was just kind of curious. But you are an award-winning commercial photographer. Also a, a film director, Michael. That's interesting to me. What has this last two months or three months been like for you? Well, I, I focused, I think that um, uh, many of our entrepreneurs here and our entrepreneurs in our audience can probably understand. For the photography market, um, for the photography market, you've had the classic um, glut of supply because digital cameras have made it easy for everyone to be a photographer mm -hmm. and lack of high end demand because magazines are going out of business and advertising has moved to social media where it's ephemeral, where it's quick and easy and cheap. And so I'm focusing my efforts on businesses and things to you know, to make money at this point in my life and have not been shooting a tremendous amount to begin with. So the past three months have really just affect, you know, affected not my shooting, but my travel. I did mm -hmm. 45,000 miles in January and February in the air. Mm -hmm. I had business trips to London and all over the place. And I haven't gone anywhere since February 24th or mm -hmm. whatever. So it, I had a show uh, planned at Photo London, which would have been last week. Um, Photo London obviously canceled the big art fair. They canceled uh, that event. Uh, there's a photography uh, festival that my wife and I go to in the south of France in Arles. That's been canceled. So it's really the the travel and the stay at home. But uh, you know, I'm 
I'm still working from my desk where I have my inbox and my email and <laughs> which is my list. And, um, you know, we're still pushing through stuff. Mm -hmm. How has that been? One of the things that we've discussed is just the mental aspects of it. You know, you've obviously had to make some adjustments. You're unable to travel. You're in the house. How were you able to remain positive and happy? What are some of the things that you did during that process? I, I actually welcomed it because for the past three years, my wife lived in New York. Um, she had a business in New York. Mm -hmm. um, she decided to close that business and us move out here full time, but we were commuting. I mean, the, the, the amount of travel, I, you know, I do about 110,000 miles in the air every year. And mm -hmm. um, that became a lot. So mm -hmm. um, it was actually a welcome change in a way not to be getting on an airplane every week or every, you know, every two weeks and be commuting. We actually closed our New York apartment on February 20th. Mm -hmm. which was which just happened to be really really lucky and and moved everything to back to our los angeles our santa monica place so um it, it felt like a welcome change but but now i'm really ready to go somewhere <laughs> <laughs> i think everyone is it's like that was nice i remember i made a post and i thought this was like so profound i usually think most posts are profound by the way like I was like this is a good post I'm gonna put it out there and it said something to the extent of if you're not doing something to be productive during this time frame you're wasting the opportunity of a lifetime and then I got the comments back when they were like Sharifa you know you don't have to be doing something you don't have to be productive some people just you know been working for years and they need a break and I was like oh my god and I felt so bad and I was like yes there are people like yourself who have been traveling a lot, who needed just to woosah for a minute, to just sit and just breathe and just take a moment. Yeah, but that doesn't mean, I mean, for me, and I'm sure there are other people in the audience that can understand this. I mean, for me, this is a great time to build businesses too. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a time where you can get people to focus on things. I mean, I, I'm, I'm about to start two new businesses, one that's on its way, and then one's uh, um, we're talking about conceptually. And um, it's a great time where people will answer the phone and can mm -hmm. focus on other things. And if they aren't in a crisis over the virus um, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, rioting and protesting, they're, they're home with time to focus on uh, um, projects. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. De definitely. Um, heard what you said with the rioting and protesting. I do have some more questions, but I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest. Um, and we discuss travel. So Hameen Mashtagian is the co-founder of El Cid Tour. Good morning, Hameen. How are you? Good morning. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. Thank you for joining us. How are you this morning? Good, good. Actually, here is here in Barcelona in afternoon, and <laughs> this is starting to open like past few weeks. So going things going to normal right now, and you know people have energy, and, and you know after a few weeks, that everyone focuses on their own business and on their things to do. Uh, we will be open the you know the actually we have an online travel agency but we open registration and we use this opportunity to focus on you know the online aspects of our business like SEO or uh, you know social media improvement so I, I totally agree with that idea that you know in, in uh, you know lockdown we, we can focus on, on different aspects of our business or improve the, you know, different aspects of it. Mm. So tell us a little bit about El Cid Tours though. You, you are the, one of the first um, tour companies to, to start in your destination. Yeah, yeah. Actually in Europe, there are many companies that, you know, uh, took tourists to the Middle East but we actually focus on we focus uh, on Turkey, uh, Emirates, and Iran specifically. Mm -hmm. And our you know we started from Spain, 
because there are some, you know, similarities, cultural similarities between two country, two region, especially Portugal, Spain, and Middle East. Uh, so we started to focus on that, and then uh, we try to grow our business business to the whole Europe. So and, and also we we try to uh, focus on the medical tourism because Turkey is like one of the hottest destination in medical tourism right now in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we started to uh, attract, uh, you know, patients to cl- clinics there in Istanbul. And I, I think I think this is a good opportunity because uh, as we did a market research uh, last year, uh, it, it has a great potential to uh, attract people to, to this region. In Dubai, in Istanbul, in, in other part of uh, Middle East as well. Soon we will grow our services to Uzbekistan, Oman, uh, Qatar. Uh, so I, I hope pretty soon we have the whole region uh, for you know open for tourists. So let me ask you a question. I mean, do you know a lot of people? Uh, actually, two years ago when I wanted to start. No, in Barcelona, I was I, I arrived here three years ago. So I went to business school and started to work as an intern and uh, go my, you know, connections. You, uh, you know, I went to some exhibitions just as an intern mm-hmm. and introduced myself, uh, try to find some people to connect with. But now in terms of the, you know, business to business connections, uh, for for the first year, I think that that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. But you know, in in the long run, we need we need to focus and try much harder. So that was a yes, or you you know a lot of people? Because I need a personal favor. You know, <laughs> uh, in, in terms of in terms of business, yes, yes, here in Barcelona. <laughs> but you know, in Europe, no, I, I I don't know much people. I don't need people in Europe. This is what I need you to do for me, okay? I need you to find someone in the royal family, okay? I need a prince or something. I need to get married and move to Dubai. I need you to help me, okay? Help me. Help us sister out. Do you know anybody in the royal family? I really want to. I try my best because I, I know that, they, you know, Dubai is one of the, you know, best destination in the world. So. I know, I know. I'm gonna come. Visit. I'm giving you a hard time, he, he looks like he's on the hot seat. Like, oh my god! I was just wondering because someone somewhere knows someone in the Saudi royal family or the Dubai royal family. They know a prince or something, and I'm trying to find one. I want to be wife number thirty-two. That's for some reason I like that number because the first thirty wives they do too much work. I want him. I want him to just buy me a house and just forget I even exist. Where's 31? They over there with him. They in the house, they in the house with him, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> They're distracting him so he don't think about me. Okay, I'm gonna stop giving y'all a hard time. Yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> You're looking at a travel agency for a dating hookup? <laughs> I'm looking for you too, Melissa, because all you eight-figure people all hang out in the same community. So I'm going to come down here and talk to you about finding your rich husband. That's why I do this show. The whole point of this show is to ask everybody, Adria, Michael, Melissa, Hameen, does anybody know a rich man? Who wants to watch? I'm gonna stop. Let me stop. I'm giving you a hard time today. Melissa's calling me out on my shit though. Melissa's like, look, there are important things going on in the world, and you're trying to get a husband. I'm sorry. I forgot all about my next guest. I didn't really, but I'm gonna bring you in so so it doesn't, I don't feel as bad. Our next guest, she's so young, she's help here to help people like me, Abby Reader. And she is a local SDSU student, as well as a Rock Church member. And she it has launched San Diego's chapter of Leave It to Us, Fee Free Senior Citizen Shopping. Good morning, Abby. How are you? Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm good. How are you? I am good. Sorry for not having a husband. But other than that, I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. 
one of the things that, that interests me about your bio, obviously, is the leave it to us, the fee-free senior citizen shopping. And so I want to hear about that. But one of the things that I really um, was so proud of, just proud of in America, was that stores began to give hours on certain days to senior citizens because people were coming in, they were hoarding, taking all the toilet tissue, taking all the water, and then the senior citizens didn't have anything left. And they said, you know what, let's take care of this group of people. So tell us a little bit about the Leave It To Us. Yeah, so Leave It To Us is a nonprofit that started in Chicago by a University of Alabama student. And it got really big up there. And so he decided to start expanding nationwide. And I found out about it through a friend in LA, actually, um, who told me, do you want to come help? And I was like, well, unfortunately, I'm in San Diego, but I'd love to start a chapter here. So I reached out to uh, the founder in Chicago. And a couple of Zoom calls later, we were able to get it all set up. And um, yeah, we've been serving seniors for the last couple of months now. Um, we do it free of any fees. We just ask for reimbursement for the groceries themselves. And we drop off, one of my volunteers will shop for the senior and drop off the groceries outside of their home um, so that they don't have to come into contact with anyone. And it's completely safe. And we always make sure to follow all the protocols. When did um, Leave It To Us launch in San Diego? I think around mid-March. It was Shortly after my soccer, I'm a soccer player at SDSU, and so our season got, our spring season got canceled due to COVID-19, and so I had a lot of time on my hands, um, and so when I found out about this around March, I decided to get it launched here. So this was launched as a direct result of COVID-19, correct? Yes, yeah, in order to service seniors, yeah. Okay, and how does that make you feel, though, that you're able to go out and help people? It's incredibly rewarding the emails we get from seniors just demonstrating how thankful they are it makes it so worthwhile like it's a volunteer program but i would take the intrinsic reward of being able to help people who are in such a need for this service uh, mm -hmm. over having money for it like i just love being able you know we'll hear people who say i'm i'm i have cancer i have this or that, you know, all these different comorbidities and I'm afraid to go out and I don't have any family in the area. Like, can you please help me? And it's like, absolutely. Like, we're so happy to help you, happy to help anyone who's in that position. And I mean, our ultimate goal is to keep people safe who are particularly at a high risk for getting seriously sick from COVID. So if we, we only accept volunteers who, you know, feel comfortable and healthy enough to go out into the community to, to do this shopping for uh, seniors and other high-risk individuals. So if we can put that burden on ourselves who are at a lower risk than you, like, absolutely, like, let's do it. Let's help you. How do the seniors typically find out about the program? Um, a lot of our exposure has been through the news, um, through TV articles. We do a lot of Facebook marketing as well. That's been pretty effective. Do you feel... Or, or to your knowledge, is this going to be an ongoing program or was this created for this, this specific purpose and that's, go, that's where it's going to end? Well, originally it was created for this specific purpose for COVID-19, but I'm starting to realize as we evolve that even when life goes back to normal for the majority of us, people who are at high risk for getting the virus and are having serious complications from the virus, they're still not going to be able to go out long past when we like, I mean, I feel like things are kind of going back to a new sense of normal, but they're definitely still not for our seniors. And I don't see it going back to a true normal for them for a really long time. And I think that since we do have this group of about 50 volunteers together now who are clearly dedicated to serving their community, I think that's a really special thing to have together. And I think it holds great value to keep this group together and keep us working towards improving the community no matter what the times are. You're very well-spoken. Thank I just wanted to point that out. You are very well, you know, because I love doing these shows and I hear people all the time and they're like, oh, look at the, you know, the kids, not to call you a kid, but to look at the young people, they're out doing this, they're out doing that. So when I see one, I'm like, you know what, you are our future. When I see someone who is doing something positive in the community, making a difference, giving of their time, I, I just personally would love to applaud you in your efforts. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You are so welcome. Now, again, my panel is quiet today. 
I got to get the panel up and it's early in the morning, except for me in the afternoon. If you have questions or comments for any of today's guests, please feel free to jump in and ask your questions. While you think of your questions, I'm going to go back over to me. We keep talking about the new normal, the new normal, the new normal. Um, there are people who feel that we we'll never get back to the, exactly the way things are. One of the things that you mentioned is that you refocus online. Um, you focused on what you can do online. Do you feel moving forward that you, you're going to still have the same um, focus online or are you just going to go back to towards the way they were? Um, actually, you know, the travel changed in past uh, few years. It, you know, it, it converts to online business. Although the, the travel is to visit everywhere, but, you know, the concept of the travel agency, booking tours, and all the process is go through the whole process of mobile and, you know, laptop process. So but I prefer, you know, to focus on online marketing and social media because, you know, in future it has, you know, more impact on, on my clients. So, if, for example, if you uh, put, you know, the experiences and cultural behaviors on, on your website, and give them an opportunity to, to visitors to, to look, look at them, feel them, you know, book them through your website. Actually, it's much better than someone come to the store and ask well, what's gonna do for, you know, next month or what you, ha you will offer us, uh, I don't know, in Mexico, for example, but you have it online on your website. You know, I, I also, look uh, for some uh, you know partners that create like a virtual reality uh, you know uh, virtual reality uh, views so i want to uh, create some of the uh, you know best destinations in in my area as a virtual reality and put them on my website so the, the, the clients can visit there and and th it, these these destinations are not in google so you can see, watch them, you know, see them on Google, but this is not a, like a 3D view. So I think this, this is a good experience as well when you, you know, share the feelings of, you know, being there with your, with your clients. Mm. Now, many people feel that, you know, with the advance of the internet, they can just go and book any package. So they no longer need a travel agent. No, they don't need a tour company. What is your response to that? <laughs> Uh, actually, you know, for you know, for research, you don't need a, any travel agent. But for book, you need a travel agent because uh, when you want to book something and want to start travel, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. So you should trust someone to give you the actually the, the idea of the, the past experience. You can re read the review of a destination or a tour guide, but unless you trust on someone to do this so it's, it won't gonna happen so you you need someone to trust and ask as ask someone who who already you know felt this and experienced these feelings of travel into unknown places or i don't know when you want to you know book a book a medical medical uh, experience for medical tourists, you need someone to, you know, give you advice, give you like, a, uh, give you uh, the reason uh, to trust. So I think travel agent is the, is the major and important role here, play an important role here, because it gives you this trust that you can trust in us and book with us so we can create and tailor made your experience, which is now is very important. You know, the normal travel agency, I think has gone. So each travel agency, even the smallest one, should tailor made uh, the, the experience that offered to the clients. So I think that that would be very important in the mm -hmm. next few years. I like that. I definitely like that answer it is we are all changing, but we are all still basically the same. So I wanted to go over to, who was that? I'm sorry, I had a question. Melissa, because I got 
talking about the list and the information. And I love your story. Your story came from the heart. But one of the things that intrigued me about you and your bio was that you've written, authored 10 books. There are so many people who, you know, they've been working on dreaming of one book for 30 years. They haven't actually gotten to write it. But you've <laughs> written 10 books, correct? Yes, yes. It's actually funny because it's COVID. So I'm like, you know, I need my hair done, my nails done. Like, you know, I need my teeth whitened. So a couple of days ago, I actually had the hairstylist come over mm -hmm. and she saw my 10 books, which are literally right here on this wine shelf. And she goes, what are those books with your name on them? And I was like, oh, yeah, it's just books that I wrote. Because I don't really go around saying, oh, hey, I wrote 10 books, like <laughs> I'm somebody. So um, she had mentioned like her daughter has been cheering her on for many, many years because she's been a hairstylist for 17 years um, and just saying like, go mom, write your book, write your book. Like I'm here to support you. And I think it's a struggle. So I write about life, um, life and business and all that kind of fun stuff. But the first two books I wrote in 2014, and if you line my books up, the spines are upside down and I refuse to change it because it's the story of, I didn't know what I was doing. You don't have to know what you're doing. You just need to actually do it. So when I go on tours or do any of those things, I'm like, here's my 10 books. And the first two are upside down because <laughs> I didn't know. And nobody told me. And so you just got to do you. And if you do you, you will be successful. You make everything sound so easy. So I want to go to your class. What, what is your class or your next webinar, your next training? I, I want to sign up. Let's... Okay, well, we can work together one on one because it's all I do. <laughs> <laughs> You make everything sound so simple, so easy. I made 10 books, two of them were wrong. That's okay. It's life. Like you're, I, I was in the town. You gotta fail. Like you just got to fail to be successful. Like Michael was talking about how he's got these two businesses that he's going to open. One is just a concept and one is like on its way. And Abby's like, Hey, I thought of this idea on the go, but now that I've engaged myself in community. And I think that's the key is and that's something that you've built here is like, we've all become a community. So I can't imagine that the six of us are going to walk away today and say, like, I don't want to touch base with um, any of us, because at the end of the day, like all of us spent the last hour and we've committed to each other um, this time and space and energy. And so it would do a disservice to all of us to not connect outside of this space. That's how you get people to sign up for your class right there, Melissa, because I'm still <laughs> signing up. I'm, I'm going to make you a class. You don't even have a class, but look, you're going to go to this class and all of us are going to be sitting there like, okay, what next, Melissa? What do we need to do? So I actually have a question. Can I ask the panel a question? That's what we hear for you go, Melissa. Okay. So y'all have really good energy and Michael's already drinking water and I've seen Abby do this. So like, where do you get your energy from? Like what makes you wake up in the morning and be like, I'm about to go out and find a platform to speak my, my truth and my passion. I think for me, it's just, it's the drive I have. It's like, I, I actually love getting into the office. I love being on a shoot. I love what I do and I love all aspects of what I do. It's, the business part, the running the business, the creative part, the artistic part, the, you, you know, being a photographer, you're, you learn to be a problem solver. You, there's physical problems, there's, uh, you know, uh, artistic solutions, there are things to figure out. You have to figure out the lighting. If you want to hang someone upside down in a photograph, you have to figure out how to do it. You're always problem solving. And I think for me, it, it, that was exciting in photography and it's as I do it in business it's just as exciting so I, you know you come up I come up to my office which is upstairs in my house and it's I'm excited to go to work so and that's what drives me yeah I can I can resonate with that for sure I feel like I'm very driven by my kind of future orientation like I'm always thinking about okay what can I do today to be better tomorrow to get myself closer to my future goals and so I always want to be like my best version of myself like what can I do to make myself 
improve to make myself better and so like ultimately like for me personally I want to be a doctor so I'm always thinking what's the next step on my path to becoming a doctor so right now for me that's working a medical internship for the summer I'm working at a pediatric office so every day I'm thinking how can I do my job the best that I can so that I can put myself in the best position to be able to get into medical school and work toward my ultimate goal so are you wanting to be a doctor in that area in pediatrics yeah in in the area that you're at right now I mean like in the community that you're at oh in like in San Diego yeah ideally I'd love to I'd love to stay here if I can I mean you're already engraved in the community so I would just encourage you to stay involved in the community as long as you can because that's how you're going to get your patients and just having those connections are going to build your office so much more quicker whether you you tend to realize that now or not uh, what you're doing is awesome Thank you. Yeah, I actually hadn't really even thought about like the importance of staying in my community with these relations that I've already formed. So that's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Those doors are going to open for you very quickly, especially if you've got already like a crew of 50 bonded people that are knowing everybody else outside of that. Oh, for sure. Andrea? I'm a <clears throat> communication strategist, and that really is my passion. It, it's been something that I didn't even know that I wanted to do from a very young age. I, I literally fell into it because that's who I am. And at the Solopreneur Society, we base everything on brand archetypes. I mean, it really starts from who you are inherently. And so my archetypes are, I am the mouth of a sage, the the <laughs> the heart of an outlaw and the soul of a lover. And so for me, it's that sage side is, is sharing that knowledge with, with solopreneurs, like helping um, my clients and our students understand how to develop their communication strategy to launch and grow a product or a service or whatever messaging that they're trying to do. That really is what gets me up and excited every single day. But then that outlaw kicks in and it's, like I said, the disruption part of it, the rebellious part of it, it's the helping to give the solopreneurs the permission. It, it, actually, I'm not giving them permission. I'm helping them to see that they have the permission to do and be whatever they want to be in this world in order to fulfill their mission and their vision. And so I just get so excited about that. And, you know, all of the things that I've been able to do as a result of staying true to that has been amazing. And so that's what keeps me going. I love that. And I love that you know who you are and you're so well like spoken about like, this is who I am, <laughs> and this is how I'm showing up. And, and that like attracts like, so. Thank you. That's cool. Hamim and Sharifa, I would love for you to answer too. Yes, for me, actually, the vision that I already have, you know, uh, helped me to, you know, get up every morning and try to reach it because it's your personal vision. It's not someone else's vision. It's very hard to get up for someone else and do the job for someone else. Uh, for you know for his dream to come through so but you know i i have one thing to get so I, every day i get up even even in lockdown i got up and uh, try to uh fix things uh, together and try to call someone else and to, uh, build connection so i think that you know if you every morning think about the uh, you know goals that you want to achieve uh, it will help you to, to catch it. It will help you to have the energy and focus every day on what, what you want to get. That's mm -hmm. awesome. I like that. For me, it, it's just, I love to help people. I love to be of service to people. That coupled with the fact that I'm a lifelong learner, I love to learn. I always tell people to a certain extent, I do these shows for selfish reasons because how else can I ask people who know what I want to learn. You know, I'm interested in producing more content. That's why I created my $50,000 fundraiser to cr produce television shows. So I have people like Michael, I'm like, hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? You, you know, you're in film and I just love to learn business. Andrea, how do you do that? How do entrepreneurs, solo entrepreneurs, how do they work better? Because I went to work initially to talk to my coworkers. Like when I was actually employed, like I went to go to lunch. Right. Like I'd be like, hey, I see Melissa at lunch. I do my little work and then I sit down 
and have lunch. So I just love people. I'm, I love helping people and I love learning. So that's really what um, motivates me. I think that was an excellent question. I love how you moderated it. That was kind of cool. People typically don't do that. I wanted to follow up on, with um, Andrea on your answer when you mentioned the archetypes. Yeah. Do you have a test that that with your organization? Because I'm like, I got to take that we test. We do, as a matter of fact. I love how you keep setting me up here. Um, I try. That's what I do. <laughs> and you're very good at it. Um, actually, yes, we do. We have a brand personality test. It's it's not like any other online quiz that you've taken before, because that's not how we roll. Um, and at the end of it, it will tell you what your primary archetype and your secondary archetype are. And these are based off of the archetypes from um, uh, Carol Pearson and Margaret Mark, uh, who then based their findings off of the work of Carl Jung. So these are definitely psychology-based archetypes. And um, then what we do is, we provide services and products that help people to really fully understand what that archetype means for them and how they're going to use it to show up in the world. So it's at our um, website, which I don't know if there's maybe a link that is in the description or something, but yeah, we absolutely do have a personality quiz. Yes, it's in the description, but if you wanna go ahead and give it to us. Uh, the solopreneursociety.com slash brand um, quiz. Okay, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to check it out. Maybe I'll take that quiz. And in regards to what Abby was saying, I, I think Melissa gave wonderful advice about being a part of your community. And I think it's great that you want to be a doctor, that you are going to be a doctor. And one thing that I see is that you have a great bedside manner. Like for, I, I took some Facebook quiz the other day and it said that I should be a doctor. And I was like, I have a horrible bedside manner. I, I really do. Like, you know, at 44, I know myself at this point. I'm not the person to call when you're sick at all. Because I'm like, it's, it's not good. So, Abby, yours is, I can see the smile. Like, I would just feel safe when you walked into the room. I would just be like, Abby's here. Everything's going to be okay. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, that's the social aspect of being a doctor is one of the one of my favorite parts about it and what, what draws me to that career for sure. I love just interacting with people, talking to people, getting to know them, and I'd love the opportunity to form those long lasting and meaningful relationships with patients. You were good. Like that was almost like it was scripted. Like it was those <laughs> political responses when the, the president comes to make his speech. It's like, you know what, that was that was really good. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> you are so welcome. Melissa, any other questions for the panel? Because, you know, I feel like you, 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 you were- I you got were... endless questions for this panel. <laughs> um, I think, like, does your story motivate you to do what you do? Or was it something in your life that triggered you? Like, Abby, did you have like a medical disease and you were like, oh, I want to be a doctor? Because I got to say, like way, way back in the day, I wanted to be a doctor and I wanted 12 kids. So I went to Mayo. I saw someone deliver a baby and I was like, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and not only am I out, I do not want 12 kids either. <laughs> so like, what was the trigger point or the thing in your life that shifted you into this place of purpose and passion? You know, I didn't have any experiences like that where I um, was seeing a doctor for extended periods of time, but it was, for me, it's just been kind of a combination of a lot of things added together that have accumulated to put me exactly where I am today. You know, I took a human anatomy and physiology class in high school, you know, four years ago um, that first, I guess, initiated my interest in medicine. And then I kind of was exploring different aspects of medicine and what field I might want to go into, you know, be a nurse, a PA, a doctor. And then ultimately I had a conversation with um, one of my advisors and he because I was kind of leaning towards being a physician assistant because it's less school, it's a quicker uh, path to just being able to work right away. Um, and so I, that's kind of what I thought I wanted to do. And then my counselor told me, you know, you have to really think about like, what do you want to do? Do you want to do this because it's easier or do you want to do this because it's what you want to do? And so I had to just kind of take a step back and be honest with myself and say, you know, medical school is going to be hard and it's going to be long and it's going to be a tough journey, but I 
feel like that's something I'm being called to and that I need to follow through with and I need to respond to that calling. And so just had to be honest with myself and decided to go ahead and move forward with that, with that path. I love the, the use of the word calling. Um, um, yes, because when, you, when you're called to do something, you have to do it, no matter what, you have to do it. And whether you do it now, when you're young or whether you do it years later, it's something that you have to do. One of the things that I'm curious about though is you, you wanna be a doctor, did anything with COVID-19 kind of affect you or make you take a second thought about being a doctor? Um, yeah, well, so I had during, when COVID started, I was working an internship in an ICU. And mm -hmm. so I wanna say close to more than half of the interns that were part of my internship program um, decided to leave the internship after COVID happened, um, but I decided to stay. And that definitely clarified a lot for me and just confirmed my ambitions that this is what I wanna do, that even when the world is in crisis and like I have to put myself at risk and take the risk of getting this disease or getting this virus, that that's something that I learned through this experience that I am willing to do. And even as an unpaid intern, I still felt like I had a responsibility to follow through with the commitment that I had made to uh, when I accepted the internship to help people. So that was a pretty solidifying, all of COVID has been really solidifying for my life and I've learned a lot from everything that's happened. That's wonderful. Now, now you do this for me. You go tell your parents, so you don't know her, but Sharifa Hardy said, good job, okay? <laughs> Make sure you let them know. <laughs> job well done. You're a good kid. You're a good kid. I like that. That's wonderful. Now, we are coming down to the last few minutes of the show, and what I love to do at the end of every show is just allow my guests the opportunity to speak directly to everyone who's watching the show live, as well as everyone who's watching it in the archives, and really let them know what you want them to take away from your appearance, and we're going to start with you, Hameen. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to tell them that, you know, uh, don't panic in this moment of the hardness and hardship. You know, we can focus still, uh, keep our focus to what they want to do. Just uh, have a strategy and plan for the future. And with strategy and planning, everything will be happen. Even, even if you don't have talent, you got, you, you're not talented in something, just with hardship and hard work, and having a strategy, uh, you will easily get this. And I, I, I'm pretty sure, it's because for myself it's true, you know, I, 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 I didn't, you know, uh, see myself in this situation that I am right now. I felt that, you know, I, I went to the other way and something else, but now I'm in this uh, tourist business uh, for like two years, I'm, I'm really happy because I, I really wanted to. So I started to plan and, uh, you know, build a good strategy to, to get what I want. That's right. Build that strategy to get what you want. I love those words. Michael, what do you have for us? Um, I, I think that, you know, you really can't be successful unless you're doing something you like and you have to live your dream right so um you have to do things that inspire you and get you wanting to go into your office and and work or get out and be with people or whatever that is so i think you've got to uh, follow your heart and the the reality is is sometimes it's tough it's like my business but the photography business is 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 tough the music the you know for musicians it's tough for actors it's tough and I think that if you really want it, it's just perseverance. You've got to just persevere and figure out how to do it. So I think that's the important thing to take away. That is wonderful words to live by. Abby, what do you have for us? I want to encourage anyone watching to think of a goal that you have, something you've always wanted to do, but just haven't gotten around to implementing it. And just really look at it and think, okay, like this is something that I can do and just break it down into subsequent steps and smaller goals to meet that will eventually all add up to that big goal. And I think that that's a really good way to go about achieving things that uh, you, want, you want to set your mind to achieve. Um, that's a strategy that I like to use. 
See, I was right. I mean, come on. We, we got to congratulate Abby's parents. Yeah. You you are just amazing. I, I love it. Goal setting strategies. You were paying attention in school and listening to your parents. Good girl. Andrea, what do you have for us? Um, from a messaging standpoint, I just want to say that, you know, platitudes and hyperbole, they just won't cut it, right? Our audiences want to know our core business values. They want to know who, what we stand for and what we stand against. And so this is the time for real transparency, not that BS that we've had up until now. Like really put yourself out there and let your audience know who you are. When you meet, when it, when you say let your audience know who you are from a company from a business perspective, what does that look like for you? That means being very clear, like I, you know, being very clear about look, this is these are the values that I hold as a business owner. This is what you can expect from me. This is what I stand for. This is what I stand against. You, you know, let people see who you are. This is, you know, this is me as um, a sage trying to help you to learn, as you say, Sharifa, about the things that you don't know about. Or this is me as the caregiver wanting to be protective and, and an advocate for you. They, they want to know these things. They want to know who you are. Mm, no, that's interesting because one of the things that I've read, especially, especially in this day and age, a lot of more of the millennials or the younger people are more concerned about who you are as a company, what you're doing for society, as opposed to in the past where it was just about how much you're paying me, you know, what my title is. It's like, okay, but what does the company represent as a whole? What do they stand for? What are you doing for the community? You know, who are you supporting? Who are you helping? Those are things, those are topics or issues that are more important, I think, today now than ever. Right. And that's the that's the translation, right? As a solopreneur, it's about you because you are the business. But at, at to your point, as a corporate, it is what as what is the organization? The organization still has a pulse. The organization still has an identity and your your buyers, your customers want to know what that is. That is wonderful words of advice. Melissa, we're going to let you take us out. Take us out of the show. All right, so uh, I would say four things, automate, delegate, delete, and donate. So what do you need to donate out of your life? And just put it on Facebook Marketplace and say, buy whoever comes, picks it up, uh, you got it. No price tag. Um, delete, girl, I'm with you. All my emails, inbox, zero all the way. <laughs> So I'd be deleting all that kind of stuff. Um, delegate, like who's going to be your, your team, your community, and how are they going to support you? And then um, back to the list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so getting clear. So for you, like you're like, hey, I want Prince Charming riding in on this awesome carriage or Lamborghini um, <laughs> and bring me a castle. I would really advise you to just look at that. Like, do you really want the physical thing? Cause I know like when I started dating, I was like, yep, you got to make over a hundred thousand. You've got to match my lifestyle. You got to be able to just jump on a train and, or a bus or anywhere and go to some foreign country on the drop of a dime. But then I was like, do I really want that? And the answer is no. I want someone who's going to care for me. I want someone who's going to spend quality time with me. I want someone who's really interested in what I'm interested in. I want all the things that money cannot buy. So by getting that clarity, it helped me like open up um, my own self and just say like, maybe the things that I think I value are not the things that I actually value at all. So in doing this process of, of delegating and deleting and automating and donating you really find out on a on a core level who it is that you are and what it is that you stand for and you can stand in those values and, and share those i think that's amazing so now i gotta look at why i want to be in the royal family like what my reasons are and so i'll just add a little love and a little affection and as they say a little tenderness to my castle Okay. Does that work for you, Melissa? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Cause all those things can be given in the form of physical things like candles and flowers and all that stuff. But then like, okay. So prime example, I, I thought of this while I was walking through the airport, I see all these men on their cell phones and they're away from their families. And Michael actually explained this. His wife lived in a totally different state. Um, 
but then I see these people that don't have that quantity of money, but they're carrying everyone's luggage and they're not on their phone and they're, they're engaged fully in their family. They make these family dinners and they sit down and eat them together. That's what I personally want. Um, and that's what I'm very privileged to have, but it took me a long time just to know, like, yeah, I don't want to get on your private jet with you and fly somewhere. Cause I can get my own private jet, but I never wanted that. Cause I didn't come from that. Melissa, we're going to have to have you back so we can finish this conversation. We're going to have to have everyone back, you know, because there has to, you know, we gonna keep talking Melissa, but I'm telling you, I'm going to get on that private jet. Cause right now I don't have a private jet. So if he want to take me on his jet, I'm getting on the jet while I work on my jet, like compromise, work together. That's what we need. I want to thank all of you for being Yes, on today's episode of the Roundtable Talk Show, I enjoy myself. I hope all of you enjoy yourself as well. Please come back because I have some follow-up questions I would love to ask. Um, also want to thank everyone who tuned in to today's show. We appreciate your support. Please support our guests. Visit their website. Take the test Andrea mentioned. If you're thinking of going to Europe, Middle East, Go check out LC at Tours. You know, if you're in San Diego, God forbid something happens to you a few years from now or to your child, go take them to Dr. Reader because she is amazing. And we are going to watch you, Michael. We're going to watch you and see those two businesses that you come out with since you don't want to share them on today's show. We're just going to spy on you and watch you and follow you. Is that okay, Melissa? Can I, can I follow? No. Okay. New, so new, I'll... new book coming out in um, November called Punk Post Punk and new wave. So it'll be on my website, michaelgreco.com with two C's. So that means you're going to come back before November. Absolutely. To tell yeah. us about this book and yeah. this business. Everybody keep me up to date. I want to know. So thank you all for tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow. If you are interested in being a guest, please visit the website at ashsharifa.com. Until tomorrow, everyone have a safe and a blessed day. Bye now.